Well, first I want to actually thank the Science at Cal program for inviting me to give this talk. As you can imagine, this is a very, this is a month when there, an enormous amount of attention is being paid to my culture, so I've been answering a lot of media inquiries, but they tend to be on a very narrow focus. And there's a lot more that I think is interesting about Maya culture, and what I want to do today is give you some idea of, more broadly, what Maya people in Central America developed as their own scientific knowledge, how we know about it, and how it can actually have impacts in their everyday life. And I promise we will get to uh, December 21st, 2012, at the end of this talk. But first we want to uh, actually learn a little bit more about the people whose lives are actually being reflected in this current media craze, and you won't actually see much of this in the public. So when we talk about the Maya, uh, the first thing that you have to know is that Maya is a language term, and there are actually millions of people today in the area of Mexico, Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador who speak Maya languages. So uh, if you think that the Maya disappeared, there are many, many Maya people, and many of them are descendants of the people who created what we normally call the classic Maya uh, culture. The classic Maya culture is actually what people think of when they see things like Ushmal, the site that was on my title slide, or this stila from Copan in Honduras. Um, and they're, they're called the classic Maya because in time frames that archaeologists use, the late classic period was the period when this kind of sculpture, that kind of architecture, um, spread throughout this region that you see, from eastern Mexico, from the state of Chiapas in Mexico, all the way to Honduras. Um, so from Chiapas in Mexico, all the way to Honduras, and my own actual field work has, for 30 years, been here in Honduras. Um, currently, I'm collaborating with scholars here in Chiapas, so I, I sort of span that Maya world. Um, the classic Maya were organized in city-states, so small political units that ranged in size from tens of thousands of people to hundreds of thousands of people, and that were engaged with each other through trade, social relations like intermarriage between key ruling families, and various kinds of political relationships, among them warfare. Um, in that Maya world, we can point to a whole series of sites, and these are the ones that the Electronic Atlas of Maya sites, which you can look up on the internet, judges to have been uh, at the, the, the top rank. So these are the biggest cities, the most important political centers. Now there's actually a few more that I would add to this map, and there are a few on this map that I think we would all debate about whether they really belong here. But these are normally the sites that you see information from. But the actual Maya world of the classic period was dotted with many, many, many more settlements. And on this map, you can actually see every little red triangle is another Maya site. And that actually isn't exhaustive. I could show you a map that basically is almost completely covered in red dots. This area was a was a densely occupied area from long before 1000 BC through to the time of the Spanish uh, entry into the area of the 16th century. Population changed, fell within that first century of colonization, and then has gradually recovered since then. Now, while the, the normal way that we represent Maya archaeology is the lovely sculpture that we, you saw in my first couple of slides, in fact, what I want to do is start from the other end of the spectrum, from the household. My own archaeological practice is in what's called household archaeology, looking at the everyday lives of people from the remains of their houses. And so rather than think of the normative Maya person as that male ruler from Copan that I just showed you, I want you to think for a minute of the lives of Maya men and women doing the work that was necessary to keep things together for centuries in their households. So um, think instead of women like this one in a figurine that came from this part of Belize. So how we know about the lives, the everyday lives of the Maya people is from, as I said, this practice called household archaeology, literally going out and finding the remains of people's houses, and especially the garbage dumps. 
Um, and what a, a sort of a household looks like, and this is not the humblest Maya. This is actually the household of a noble family, but a, maybe a noble family without a lot of money. So a sort of a poor noble family. Think here of Great Britain, where you can have a noble title, but some nobles are too poor to continue to live in their ancestral houses, so they've sold them and they're now used as bed and breakfasts for American tourists. Um, this group at Copan is the remains of foundations that would once have supported the house walls. And so you have these paved exterior workspaces, stairways, and the house foundations. Now I know it's very difficult to visualize what that looks like, and luckily one of my past PhD students is an especially talented um, graphic artist. So she actually produced a series of slides that I'm using one of here to give you a sense of what that would have looked like in when something like that was occupied. It's a series of platforms with houses that are actually perish made of perishable material, material that doesn't last in the tropical rainforest. Poles um, make up the walls and they're covered in mud plaster and the roof is made of palm fronds, essentially. So you have these small buildings, and most of the, the business of everyday life takes place in the exterior spaces. And when I say the business of everyday life, for the classic Maya, this included all the production that was the economy. There are no factories in classic Maya society. No one got up in the morning and went to work somewhere else. Your job, if you want to think about it that way, was right there in your household. And the excess produce that you made, that you produced, that you wanted to trade with other people came right out of the business of everyday life in places like this. The National Geographic imagines one of these households as it was populated during the classic period. And what I want to do in the rest of this talk is take you from a household like this and show you how scientific knowledge that was harnessed by the Maya in technologies underwrites this image of everyday life among all of the Maya. And so what I'm talking about here is the National Geographic is showing us that exterior working space. There again is that perishable house. With, they made the roof straw and <coughs> palm fronds. It's not quite right. Um, and back in the background, you see these terrace walls going up the slope, and those are the agricultural fields. Well, what I'm going to run through here, and it's a subset of what I could talk about in terms of scientific and technological knowledge of the Maya, I'm going to start with how the classic Maya actually managed the landscape, managed land and water, to support the agricultural production that supported millions of people, and in fact produced enough food that some of those people didn't have to spend all their time being farmers and could do other kinds of of technologies. So we're going to talk about first about the science and technology behind the, the agricultural system. What we might want to call agronomy, if it was in the university today, we'd call it the field of agronomy, so why agronomy? Then we're also going to talk about the industries, the technologies behind making cloth and making pottery. So there's a lot of pots in here. The basic technologies of everyday life, the things that people use to facilitate their lives in the Maya world were pottery and cloth and stone tools. And it's very common to read, even in textbooks by those of us who specialize in the Maya, that the Maya never used metals for tools. And I want to caution you against those kinds of, did I just lose the audio? Yeah. Um, do you want me to do something about that? Yeah, change the battery. OK, I'm going to change the battery really quickly because we're recording. Um, and while that happens, I will not talk, but I will sing. <laughs> uh, OK. This is the thing I'm relatively bad at, so I see that there's a person coming to help me. Thank you. So you can enjoy the National Geographic's image here. That gives me an opportunity to say something I should have said at the beginning. Most of the images here come from other places. I've tried to put the sources here. Many of them, some of them will be websites, and many of those websites are places that you might want to go and check out for more information. If there's a photograph that's uncredited, it 
comes from my husband and collaborator in crime, Russell Sheftek, and I have to apologize to him for not thinking that I needed to put his name on his okay. images. Okay, so we're going to talk about agronomy, but we're also going to talk about the material science of the Maya. So how they actually handled the task of taking raw materials and making them into useful things for everyday life. And again, as I was saying, we normally talk about this by comparing the Maya technologies to a certain form of European technology and saying, well, they never did, they never adopted metals, so they kept using stone tools. As if there's some cultural inheritance or requirement for humans to use a certain kind of material. Um, we get similarly when we talk about pottery, we often say they never invented the wheel as if they should have, and that's a, a deficit. But what I want to do is emphasize instead the technological knowledge and expertise that they developed. Um, oops. And then the, the final thing that I will talk about is, of course, what really brings us all together here, which is their um, mathematical, astronomical, and calendrical knowledge. And you might think in this everyday house, you see no evidence of that. But not so. In fact, what we know is that the houses of the everyday people are oriented according to astronomical knowledge. We know that house sizes and shapes are very regular from very early on. And they undoubtedly use the calculation system that the mathematics that is primarily represented in, in calendars or dates uh, exemplifies. And we also know that such things as storing surplus from the harvest and figuring out how much to give the king and figuring out what, what proportion of a field you needed to plant in order to bring the family through the winter, all of that requires the use of the mathematical system. So even though houses of everyday people don't necessarily give us records of mathematical calculations, we have every reason to think that math was pervasive, not actually limited in use to just the esoterics of recording astronomy, calendars, and history. So let's start with agronomy. When I say how the Maya managed their landscape in order to be able to produce surplus so that people could do more than just be farmers, what I'm talking about is how they met a challenge that's very familiar in California. The Maya landscape is in a climate area that has a marked rainy and dry season. So during the dry season, the supply of water all comes from what's available on the ground. No rain, you have to have access to water on the ground. But unlike our experience in California, the Maya lowlands had a large area with no surface rivers. Only towards the southern part do we find sur surface rivers. And in most places in the Maya area, because it's a limestone geology, the water percolates through below the limestone, and it is primarily available through kind of holes that are punched through. Um, they're called sinkholes when they happen in Florida, which is the same geological uh, formation as Yucatan. In Yucatan, they're called cenotes, which is from the tonot, a Maya word. So the first challenge that Maya people would have had in this landscape is how to make certain they had enough water for all the things they wanted to do, including population centers with large numbers of people. You can spread the people across the landscape where water naturally occurs. But what if you want to have a city and want to have people stay there year round? You have to have water available. And this slide um, actually shows the red things are representations of Maya temples. And what your, the white things are the so-called sakbes or roads. What you're looking at is how in a gently sloping terrain, the Maya used natural low areas that they managed. Um, they would actually alter to collect water, but also use their architecture and built it in such a way as to create reservoirs or ponds along with the architecture. Now, much of our knowledge about the hydrology the science of hydrology as practiced by the Maya comes from the work of Vernon Scarborough of the University of Cincinnati and his various collaborators. And recently, Vernon Scarborough has been making the point that the way that the Maya managed the water in this terrain 
actually offers lessons that would be useful today in the world to help keep um, basically subsistence farmers from suffering so much from droughts. So these are technologies and, and knowledge of hydrology that have lessons for us today. Um, in this particular presentation, what, uh, what Scarborough and Ferrande are talking about is the way that these depressions that existed on the landscapes, these are sections through depressions called aguadas in Spanish, water holes essentially, were managed and reinforced by the Maya so that they could become basins for collecting the water that would come down the slopes. And what Scarborough has demonstrated is that these are being placed in the best possible locations for collecting the downflow. In other words, there was an analysis of the drainage system that was understood by the Maya architects of these. And that's one form of Maya scientific knowledge is of hydrology, again, one of our environmental sciences today. In built-up areas, and this is from the great Maya site of Tikal in Guatemala, uh, Scarborough and company have shown how the placement of the architecture around lower-lying areas led to the creation of reservoirs. And these are also, they, they're set up in such a way that they drain in managed ways. And I want to draw your attention over here in the so-called Temple Reservoir to the fact that this is next to a spring. You might say, well, that's just the water's gathering like when we do roads badly in California, sometimes we cut off a stream and then in the spring you'll see a big pond. But the, the evidence that this is not just accidental or coincidental, but is actually part of the expression of scientific knowledge comes from the fact that next to this spring, on the way into the Temple Reservoir, they built what's called a silting tank. And if you know anything about drainage, one of the problems of water drainage is it can actually carry the soil down with it, and eventually the system gets silted up and doesn't work. And that actually happened in many Maya sites, because their, their knowledge of hydrology was just as good as ours. So, they had the same problems we had on California roads, where we design a solution that's supposed to work forever, and it works for 10 years. Um, but that silting tank is one of the signs, one of the pieces of evidence, that they understood what happened when you had these kinds of drainage systems. And it's because of those reservoirs that they were able to have those large populations in cities that, that went up to over hundreds of thousands of people, and it's because of the systems of drainage and management that they were able to keep water in place throughout the, the dry season. Now we now know that one of the major impacts that caused many of the sites in the Maya region to be partially abandoned in the 9th century, between 800 and 900, may have been because of catastrophic droughts. So you've got a water system that you built up, but when the amount of input in the rainy season goes down, well, again, we in California all know what happens. You have water rationing, and eventually you just can't support the population. The other half of the economy is the management of soil. And here, Maya people had soil science that was extraordinary. And this is not just limited to the Maya people. In fact, we find evidence of this kind of what's called a raised field system from Wisconsin all the way south to the Amazon. Peoples of the Americas built very extraordinary field systems. And what they essentially did was <coughs> dig a series of canals or ditches, take the rich soil from in them and pile it up next to the canals to form what are called raised fields. Now, not only are these raised fields then going to be above the water table during the rainiest part of the year, so you've increased your possible arable soil where you can actually plant plants, but that muck that they're getting up and putting on top is rich in organic material. It's got lots of plants. So it's a naturally fertilized kind of field system. And this one, as it says, is from the area called Kultrauser Swamp in Belize. What we're looking at is 10 to 30 meter lawn on a side raised fields. The Kultrauser Swamp was one of the first such field systems studied way back in the 1980s. It was being uh, published by a, a large number of people, including Dennis Poulston, um, but name, really a string of names too long to put on the slide. 
I direct you to that article if you want to see some of the earliest on this. So we know that in the low-lying areas, they were building up raised fields. But the other thing the Maya did, which is actually something we've only really appreciated the extent of over the last 15 to 20 years, is the amount of terracing they did. Now, this is work by Cynthia Robin at Northwestern University at a small site called Chan in Belize. And it's not an important site. It's a really small site. I mean, it's only 3.2 square kilometers. If you don't do kilometers, uh, it's about uh, 8 kilometers equals 5 miles. Okay, so that's a tiny amount of space. There's 287 households. Each of the pink things is the houses of a farmer. But there's more than a 1,000 terraces built throughout this terrain. So each of these green things that you're looking at are terraces that were built, like the terraces the National Geographic image showed us, that were built along the slopes in order to create sometimes relatively narrow but flat fields. And what that did was change the slopes into farmable field land and literally multiplied the amount of farmable field land throughout these sites. And this is just a tiny example. I could show you one after another of these terraced field systems. So where the Maya were living near rivers with large swampy areas, they built up raised fields. And where they were living on slopes, even relatively modest sized populations built enormous retention. And that's all a form of soil science, agronomy, agricultural management. And again, it's based on understanding the dynamics of erosion of soil and understanding the implications of eroding soil from slopes. Again, one of the things that too often people say about the Moana, they'll say, well, they got too big and they wrecked their environment. And I want to push back a little on that. There are specific places in the Maya world where the, in, where the local population may have gotten larger than could really be sustained. But the Maya were managing the, air, the landscape. And in fact, a colleague at UC Riverside calls the, the terrain a managed mosaic. So we've really rapidly gone through the agronomy, hydrology, and soil science of the Maya. What these things were, were the basic underpinnings of the economy. This is an agricultural economy. It's based on farming. Having enough surplus from farming to uh, support laborers who could do things other than farm is key to everything else the Maya did. So what were all these fields for? What was the point? Well, the first thing that they were for, and the biggest point, of course, is to raise sufficient food for people to eat. And here you've got a nice ear of corn that they're using an obsidian blade, and obsidian is a black volcanic glass, to cut the corn kernels off. Now that image, which comes from a former doctoral student of mine, is a reconstruction of what we know happened with this obsidian blade, with this specific obsidian blade. The way we know it is that still stuck to the edges of it, thousands of years later, are little grains of starch from corn. That's corn starch. If any of you have corn starch in your pantry, that's what it looks like under a microscope. Um, so what we can do is actually say, what plants were the Maya growing in those fields and using in their everyday life. Even though the plant remains in general are very fragile, starches turn out to actually be pretty um, durable. And when we actually look at what the Maya were using, what we find out is that managed mosaic, those fields themselves, were being planted with a wide variety of plants and a mix of plants that goes far beyond the corn, beans, and squash that I was taught were the staples of their diet when I was a student. Corn is important, but in fact, I had to look really hard to find this cornstarch image from my, my student's dissertation, because what she found was a variety of plants that's so diverse that it includes things like multiple kinds of squashes, multiple kinds of palm fronds, remember the palm frond roots? Multiple kinds of fruits, and a variety of other plants that probably were used for more than food. The agriculture of the Maya actually maintained a plant community that was the focus of other parts of their science and industry. 
So it's not just for food, it's also for medicine. Biomedicine has probably been understudied and under-talked about for one reason and one reason only, bad translation. So if you look here, this is a manuscript that was written using the Roman alphabet introduced by Europeans in the 16th century, but it's written in a Maya language, Yucatec, the Maya language of, that dominated most of Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula. And what it is recording are things like this. It's a medical manual. Now, the medical practice involved included the use of a wide range of plants. Such a wide range of plants that when the first translations, so this is this was these manuscripts started being studied by Europeans in the 19th century, and this translation is basically a late 19th century translation. We didn't even know the plants. So all the plant names in here use European plant names, but they're not the right words. We'd have to put all Maya plant names in there, and you wouldn't recognize any of them. So I decided to use this one because having a whole bunch of letters that you can't pronounce seemed to be unhelpful. Because what I want you to focus on is this manual has the bite of a rattlesnake or an asp or whatever snake. We didn't have asps. It's not Egypt. The bite of a rattlesnake or a fer de lance or any other poisonous snake. And as my workman in Honduras told me when I stepped on a fer de lance, don't worry, of the 109 snakes in Honduras, only seven are poisonous. Um, seven. So if a person is bitten by a rattlesnake, the root of snake squash, as well as the root of meadow gourd, as well as the leaf of not garlic, with one crystal of salt, they did have salt, and not lemon juice, that was introduced, are to be found, then it's to be given to be drunk. The bite hole is to be cauterized with it. If you read it and think about it as medicine, you realize that what you're getting is medical practice that includes uh, plant-based remedies, direct interventions with the wound, with the body, as well as in many other, um, and this one doesn't happen to have it, in many others, they also talk about the appropriate words to be spoken because they understood that diseases in particular were caused both by natural causes, what you would recognize as natural causes, but also by the malign influences of supernatural beings or ancestors that you had offended. So in many of these, you get a mixture of plant remedies, physical intervention, and saying the right words to tell the deities that you're sorry that you did whatever you did wrong. And because of that last piece, because in 20th century thought, science and religion don't mix, these are normally published and discussed as ritual texts. But I want to reclaim them as medical knowledge, as applied medical knowledge. These things were written down before the 16th century. And if any of you want to take a look at what medicine in Europe was like before the 16th century, it was no different. You had a combination of using traditional plant remedies, using various kinds of physical manifestations, and then also um, various kinds of beliefs about the malign influences of the planets, not of your ancestors. You know, Mercury had to be rising in the right side of the world for you to get over your venereal diseases. So, I could go on, I could show you many, many such things. In a, a study done by an undergraduate here at Berkeley, in a course of mine, she was able to show that one section of this particular manuscript actually covers women's health and has remedies for a whole range of women's health issues. Not only that, she was able to look at the plants that we recovered from a site in El Salvador that was sealed by volcanic ash, and she was able to show that the person in that particular site who we know is a religious practitioner had all the remedies for women's health issues that were in this manuscript. So they were probably specialist practitioners for different <coughs> kinds of health issues. If you want to think of them as the first gynecologists. I think of them as the first doulas. So uh, the plant knowledge that the Maya had, in other words, supported certainly a diverse range of food and everyday subsistence needs, but went beyond that to support medicine, and even beyond that, support technologies such as cloth production. So in this scene from a palace on um, a painted vase from the Maya area, you can see um, 
various kinds of, these are corn tamales, this, this uh, would have had um, chocolate rendered in it. But I want to actually focus our attention on the implied use of plants in the incredible costume. Things like this, we know, were made out of cotton and other fibers, domesticated and managed and produced in a wide variety of ways, including everything from tie-dyeing, not unlike Indonesian batik, to a variety of weaving techniques that integrated um, fibers based on different plants and animals together. So, technologies of everyday life that Maya people were practicing in that household, remember the National Geographic's image of the woman with the loom, every household, every basic household that was producing cloth was drawing on the science of agronomy, which provided the raw materials in terms of fibers, but also on a plant science, on the knowledge of plant properties to collect the dye stuffs that they were using. In every household in the Maya area, there were scientific principles at work in translating those ingredients into what's used in everyday life. And in fact, much of our knowledge of everyday life comes from the products of the final technology I'm going to talk about before turning to December 21st, and that's pottery. And as I said earlier, and I'm a specialist in pottery, so this is sort of, I put it last and I wouldn't talk about it the whole time. The normal way to talk about pottery in this area is to say what they didn't do. They didn't use the wheel. They didn't use kilns. Oh, wait, they did. Um, in fact, they used a wide variety of kilns built on principles different than the European kilns that we use as the normative model. When you start looking at the technology of ceramics in this area, which begins before 1800 BC, you see that, in fact, it has a different goal than the ceramic technology of Europe. The things that people were interested in doing in the Americas, and especially in the Maya area with ceramics, were to exploit the plasticity, the ability to bend clay into all sorts of shapes and make it stay. So you have a large amount of modeled figures. The ability to control the atmosphere, how much oxygen was available at different points in the firing to produce black and white effects. Um, what, if you know anything about Japanese raku pottery, what, was, what is considered high art in Japanese pottery making today. It wasn't necessarily to produce large volumes of standard, uniform, high-fired products to sell through marketing. Much ceramic production took place within these households, and the exchange was, the firing itself was small scale. This is a meter wide, this kiln. And the exchange probably was between household and household. So the economic system was different, and therefore the science and technology used were different. But I know that's not the main reason you're here, because you probably have never heard any of that before. Uh, even when I give talks about this, and I'm a household archaeologist, normally I start with these kinds of images. And I try and talk to you about households while showing you carved lintels from palaces. Uh, so. Carved lintels from palaces, lintel is the thing over a doorway, and carved standing monuments have dominated the public image of the Maya. And for that public image, what speaks to scientific knowledge is the use of the writing system that you see throughout here, and the use of the number system, which is right here, I'm going to show you a little bit more of that in a second, to record specific dates in an ongoing calendar system that's one of a several calendar systems the Maya developed that, among other things, recorded their astronomical knowledge. Now, some of what we know about this part of Maya scientific knowledge comes from the monuments themselves, but truly our breakthroughs came in the 19th and early 20th century from three perishable manuscripts that were sent in the early colonial period back to Europe. And you're looking at one called the Dresden Codex because it's preserved in Dresden today. The other two are the Paris and the Madrid Codex. They went back to Spain basically as trophies of conquest to the royal family of Spain, which was also the royal family of Europe. And these were rediscovered in the 19th century. 
the page you're looking at here actually has astronomical calculation tables here that allow you, and this is the sign for, for star, and in this case it's the great star, Venus. This is the, one of the so-called Venus tables that allowed the Maya to track where Venus would be in the sky throughout time and to calculate into the future where Venus would be. They had tables for lunar eclipses, solar eclipses, and tracking multiple planetary bodies. This is the kind of knowledge that made it possible for us to first begin deciphering their writing system because the way those astronomical bodies work is universally reconstructible. So as long as we understood their numerical system, we could figure out what those tables were doing. And that was the first route into Maya knowledge. Unfortunately, it took us a century before we understood the writing around those numbers and, and so on. And it's that lag time of a century that actually is responsible for the mystical misinformation about the Maya that continues to circulate today. Because it wasn't really till the 1950s that a Russian scholar told us, hey, you can read these inscriptions. It wasn't until the 1960s that a Russian woman living in the US told us, hey, they're historical inscriptions. It wasn't until the 1970s that the Cold War anti-Russian fervor died down enough for everybody to come out and say, hey, these are histories that these Maya people were writing. They're not just esoteric prophetic knowledge of astronomer priests sitting on top of their pyramids and watching the sky go by. Although they did sit on top of their pyramids and watch the sky go by. So one of the really interesting things is that there's a series of observatories or structures that were used as observatories that we've identified. Here at Chichen Itza, the so-called Karakol, um, if you look through these slit windows that you can see partially preserved, some of them line up on the horizon with specific rising or setting of especially Venus, the planet Venus. So you could use this as an observatory, but a visual observatory. No lenses, no, no telescopes. You'd stand there and look through the window slit. Similarly, the tower at the palace of Palenque in Chiapas had certain windows where you could look out. And in observatories like this, often on the inside, you'll find the sign for star or Venus near such windows, basically telling you, look here for Venus. Um, and it's a sort of a rule of thumb. If a building looks odd in these sites, we think maybe it was used for observation. But it doesn't have to be a really odd building like those two. What the Maya were actually doing is shown in these two um, images, actually from Tony Avini's book, Sky Watchers of Ancient Mexico, and I did have the, the thing in, but this is obviously I got the wrong version of my, my PowerPoint. Sorry about that. Um, you have an observer, and there's pyramids. They're looking across the pyramids and watching every day as the sun comes up and goes down, or as the moon comes up and goes down, or as Venus comes up and goes down. Actually, that's me, so they're going this way. You all know that the sun rises and the east. I just did it backwards because I don't know why west is towards me. Um, so they're watching this. And over the course of a year, the sun doesn't rise and set in precisely the same place on the horizon. Anybody who's watched the sunset and get closer and closer to Mount Tamil Pius knows what I'm talking about. Well, the Maya noticed that, in fact, on December 22nd, this uh, rising and setting reached its southernmost point on the horizon. And on um, June 21st, it was further to the north. And in March and September, it was right in the middle. And so they built a much more common kind of observatory, which was first identified at this site, Washaktun in Guatemala, where you stand at one point, you look across some monuments that have basically lined you up, and you can see the sun rising on March 21st, the equinox of March 21st. You stand in the same place and look across the corner of the temple to the right, you see the December solstice sunrise, and the temple to the left, you see the summer solstice sunrise. So this is their astronomical orient, uh, their, how they get their astronomical knowledge. Building uh, places where they could watch the rising and setting and count 
how many days were elapsed between one of these events and another? We know that's what they're doing. We knew that it was implicit in these, these things. But as of this year, we have something fabulous because we found one of their workrooms at the site of Shultrum, Guatemala. An interior space that had been filled in with dirt was cleared. So it had been filled in with dirt to build another building on top of it. And it's got these lovely figures on the wall, but they're not what we care about. What we care about is that there's really tiny, almost indistinguishable things on the wall. And they're just like in those manuscripts, they're notations of numbers. This is just all numbers. Column one counts 1,195,000 elapsed days. I should have figured out how many years that was. Somebody who's better at math can do that for me right now. Um, each of these is a record being made rapidly by an astronomer. That's the only people who need to count that many days to project forward into time or backward into time what was going to happen in the night sky or the day sky, but probably the night sky. And this is probably just one of many such rooms. Now, what were they projecting forward? They were projecting forward, as I said, a count. And it's this kind of count that is getting us into our current trouble. Here is what's called the long count. It's just a count of individual days beginning in 3114 BC, one, two, three, four, continuously. The Maya had a solar calendar. They had a lunar calendar. They had all of these other things. But the long count itself is just how many days have elapsed since the beginning point. It's a continuous calendar and one of the most extraordinary <coughs> scientific achievements of an ancient people that you could possibly hope for. And it, it works in base 20. And the main thing you need to know is that the bars are five, <coughs> And the dots are 1. So this number is 5 plus 5 is 10, and there's two dots, so it's 12. The thing in the middle, they didn't like empty space, so they put a little placeholder in. So that's 12 periods that we call the Batum. Those are approximately 394 years. Okay? But just in terms of numbers of days. Because you have to really start reading these from the key. So I want you to ignore this. Just ignore that. We're going to start with eight individual days, 17 groups of 20 days, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19 groups of, it should be 400 days, 20 times 20. But they realized 400 is really close to 365, so they screwed it a little bit. And in the calendar, they make it into 360 days. So it's 360 days. And then we have our 394 year, which is, you can do the math, right? That, by the way, is on the website of fancy.org. If you want to go and find out what the day is in any day, you can go and find that. So, the Maya had a calendar that ran continuously from a beginning fixed point forever. Forever. But, the current kind of interpretation which many humorous things, and this is from Bizarro, um, is that they predicted the end of their calendar this coming month. So in my last few slides, I want to take you through what, why, we, why people think that and why it's not true. OK? This is the guilty party. It's a monument for a place called Torture Bureau. David Stewart, who's probably the most famous and most skilled reader of Maya writing that there is, tells us that what this relevant section says is that this much time, this, these many days, so two days, nine periods of 20 days, three periods of 180, uh, 360 days, excuse me, eight periods of 360 times 20 is 7,200 days, and three periods of times 20 is 144,000 days. So that's a very big number of days. That many days before the 13th back to will end, our month, there was an event. At Tortuguero, what they're telling us is they did something, and it was that much time before way in the future would come. Why does somebody do something like that? Well, the Maya do this all the time. 
the Maya historical inscriptions are always tying themselves to really long periods of time. It's a way of saying, my memory will be around in thousands of years. It's a way of saying, my culture endures and has endured for millions of years. Uh, this year, we found only the second explicit reference in the Maya inscriptions to this very December. And it's this, uh, this is only part of the block five from the hieroglyph of Stairway 2, from structure 13 out of 10, from Maka Road in Guatemala. Uh, and if you want to read about this, you can look for the Middle American Research Institute at Tulane, has a nice website about it. But again, David Stewart's the person who deciphers this. And this is his description of what's going on here. The, um, the king of a different site than La Corona had lost a lawn in bitter war. And he, we used to think he was dead. So this, this might have been the most important thing to tell us is he's not dead yet. Um, but he had actually claimed this title of 13 Khatun Lord when he was still in power and happy because he celebrated the end of the 13th period of 20 times 360 days. And now he's here trying to remake his, uh, his sort of political persona, trying to recover. And so in this particular inscription, he links himself to the 13th Baktun ending. Here's the 10, 11, 12, 13th Baktun, um, which will be for a cow. Okay? It's, the, it's three Baktuns from now. So he says, we're in about 10, 0, 0, 0. Three Baktuns from now. Three, 394 years from now. 1,200 years from now. I'm still going to be famous. Don't let that little defeat bother you. Okay, so those are the two known re direct references to this day. Neither of them carries a prophecy of anything about happening this day other than it will be 13000000. And the purpose of each of them is political. It's to link what you're doing to the far deep future to say, my, my renown will go on forever. But it's not the only instances we have of the Maya using long, deep time. And I want to show you one example of long, deep time. This is from a stairway at the Great Maya site of Yashchilan. And up here, there's a whole series of 13s, which hopefully you can see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And they were up here before. But they're all in front of the actual date. So the Maya at Yashchilan said the local date is the ninth Baktun, but that's within a, the 13th of a cycle even bigger, 20 times 394 years. And that's within the 13th of a cycle even bigger, 400 times 394 years. And do that eight times and figure out what you've got there. He, they're saying that even though they don't normally express them, there are places above the nine. That implies there's places above the 13 or the 12 that we're in right now. They just don't normally express them. And unfortunately, for any model of the Maya calendar coming to an end, different Maya sites seem to have thought of those upper numbers differently. So, as Mark Van Stone says, uh, this is an example of a long, long count date from Yash Chilan. This is the one he's talking about. Tikal does it, but it decides that, that at the time that Yachilama was saying it's 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 9, Chikal said, no, it's 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19. So that the upper levels weren't really being used. They were just for show. Why do you put them on? To say, our calendar's been going on for billions of years. Our civilization is ancient. How ancient? At Palenque, we have something even more interesting, because this is one that gets into the future. At Palenque, they record the date 4774 AD. So for the Palenqueanos, at least, the world is not coming to an end. This is the inscription at Palenque, and this little part in here, 
links the coronation of the current ruler um, to 20 Bakhtuns in the future. Way, way in the future. Plus eight days. We'll go eight days. Eight days is probably the length of the rituals of coronation, so it's probably actually the coronation is completed. Which corresponds to 4772 AD. So if you want to reset your doomsday clock to 4772 AD, feel free to do it. But I'm here to tell you that if you were at Palenque in the palace in the 7th century, you wouldn't have thought the world was coming to an end even then. Because the point of using this astronomy calendar for you was to say, our system will endure forever. Thank you very much. Uh, whose thesis in Mexico before he came here was about road systems. 
Um, they have explicitly paved road systems that usually are radial. They have a center and then the roads go out to other places. So the city state is now together. And we have a few that actually go further. And then they have unpaved routes of communication. And one of the things my student Fabio has studied is the unpaved routes of communication as well. And those routes sometimes follow the least effort, but also will follow lines of already existing relations. Way back in the back. Yeah. Is there any place in the glyphs that actually state the return of the fire serpent god to Platon as no. to the end of the day? That's an easy one. No. Okay. Yeah. Um, if there is no fire serpent god in classic Maya uh, at all. Then where um, did that term come from? It's from the manuscripts that were in circulation in the 16th century, and it was put together by 19th and 20th century Western scholars who amalgamated poorly understood sources, and now we're paying the price. So that, that is just a myth. It's, there's multiple traditions that we glommed them all together, and there's a very complicated, complex set of things to talk about there, and there's books about it. So nothing came out of the Pobabu, the... The, the Pobabu does not talk about the return of a fire serpent. It doesn't talk about Pukulka. It does say in the beginning of time there was a feathered serpent that was curled in the waters of the deep and when the gods started things. Oh, okay, thank you. And we equated those things. Yeah? Yes, thank you. Um, how were the inscriptions deciphered? There is classical mind related to... How were the inscriptions deciphered? This is a really good question. Um, the, the Maya, there are multiple Maya languages. Okay, Historically, there have been um, about two dozen Maya languages. So they are, um, there's branches as distinct as um, the Germanic branch of you know, Indo-European from the Celtic branch of Indo-European. So we're talking about languages that can be quite distant from each other. Um, when decipherment of the actual linguistic content started, I would place in the 1950s, and most people would, with the Soviet scholar Yuri Kurosov, who had been a cryptographer in World War II, he was using those paper manuscripts, which, for a variety of reasons, he knew came from Yucatan. So he used the Maya language Yucatec, which was good. Um, there wasn't a lot of linguistic information about Yucatec. He didn't necessarily understand it 100%, but he was able to use the grammar of Yucatec as a cryptographer who gave a pattern, and he was able to say, okay, given this, this little caption over a picture, should be a sentence, in Yucatec, the verb comes first. So the first thing should all be verbs. And from that flowed an enormous uh, amount of things. It's a really complicated story, which I'd love to talk about, but to actually do it justice requires its own hour or weekend. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Rosetta Stone for the writing and the calendar system. 
because he burned all of these things because they were idolatries and, and lies of the devil. That's a quote. But then he was called home to Spain to account for his um, terroristic tactics, and he wrote a book to defend himself. And in that book, he said, I burned all these things, but I kept all the knowledge. So here's all the knowledge of how the calendar works. Here's how the writing system works. Everything that was recorded in those books is, is evil. But here's how the thing worked. Yeah. And although it took us a while to figure out exactly his misunderstandings of that system, without Lambda, we wouldn't know this. But because of Lambda, we don't know things. Way back in the back, and then up here in the front. Uh, did there exist a kind of war games? Did there exist a kind of war games? We call other places based, of actual. Based on the Aztecs, we know much more about because they were actually the people the Spanish first got encountered and wrote copiously about. And uh, one of our problems is that the Spanish wrote about the Aztecs, and then once they understood the Aztecs, they just sort of applied it to like everybody else. So you get to other people, and they just basically, it's just like the Aztecs. And we know that they're not exactly like the Aztecs. But the Aztecs had what, what they call flower wars. Flower wars were formalized wars. They took place on battlefields away from the town between long-term um, traditional enemies. And they did, it, they did result in death. But their main purpose was to allow for the, the capture of you know, captives from the other party. So that kind of formalized warfare may be what's being reflected in many of these monuments, and certainly in many of the scenes that seem to show people dressed up for warfare and attacking other people. When you look carefully at them, they're, they're holding spears and attacking other people, but they're also dressed in these huge feathery costumes. And these are probably actually pageants of war. Um, but we have no doubt that actual attacks on other cities took place. Among other things, at the site of Dos Pilas in Guatemala, we can see hastily erected walls that borrowed stones from other buildings and that crossed other buildings to create an enclosed space in the center of the city. So those did happen among the Aztecs, but not the Mayas? No, I'm saying that we, we probably did have flowery wars among the Mayas as well as all-out war. The Aztecs also did all-out war. Because I think there are a couple of books that were there are lots of books on this. Yeah. I mean, if you want to read any of this stuff for the mind, you're going to find a ton of books. Yes. Yeah, but I want, I want to be very clear myself here that you want to, be, you want to watch out for the point where even the scholar uses the Aztecs instead of the Maya because we don't have the data from the Maya. So I'm going to be the more honest scholar and say, we think, yeah, but we don't know. Um, I said you next. Back to households. Yes. Did they have domestic animals? Very, very good question. Um, domestic animals were quite limited in the Americas, but we, they had the domestic the turkey and dog. And both of those were food animals. Um, the, uh, the, they didn't domesticate any larger land animals. The actual candidates around them were not particularly good for domestication. They were deer or tapers, neither of which are actually particularly good for domestication. And yet, we have evidence of deer that were corn fed, and we have imagery suggesting that they did um, sometimes grab young deer fawns and raise them in essentially captivity. So not domesticated, but, um, but kept. What do you have to um, Do you have a recommendation for a book to know more about it um, that's uh, sort of a non-specialist? To know more about which part the, of the mice? The, the uh, general introduction, perhaps, Ooh. to it. Um, well, I'm partial to a book which may not be in print anymore by John Henderson of Cornell University. Um, but I'm partial to it because I was a Cornell University undergraduate and he was my supervisor there. But I also think it's very well written and it doesn't get the, the book that most people will tell you to go to is Robert Scherer's big book, The Maya, but it's it's getting bigger and bigger by the year. And I think at this point, if you don't already know all the Maya stuff, it's way too detailed. So I would go with the Henderson book. If not Henderson, look for Norman Hammond, also a book about the Maya that, that is written on a higher level of synthesis. If you're specifically interested in the historical things, there's a book called The Chronicles of the Maya Kings and Queens, which gives basically what, what kinds of events are mentioned where. It it's, uh, tells you what we know historically. Um, if you're interested in things like warfare, transport, trade, you actually have to get outside the mine for book length treatment. There's good treatments for the Aztecs by a man named Ross Hassett. Yeah? Can you speak to anything about the development of corn or potatoes? Uh, potatoes are 
and D is not a Latin, um, and I can't really speak to though. Uh, corn, though, corn's interesting, and is a specialization of my colleague Christine Castro on this campus, who's telling us about me, the city of ancient plants. Um, corn has a history that points to South America as likely where the earliest domestication took place. We have contested the corn situation in Mesoamerica right now is contested because we used to say we get very early corn going back to about 7,000 BC. But that was based on dates in cave sediments. And when the corn crops themselves were tested, they came out much more recent in the 3,000 BC. And that may suggest that corn was late on the, the horizon for people in this area. Now, genetically, what happened is you have a grass, Teosinte, which looks like any kind of a grass you've got around here with a little grassy head, not very, wouldn't be very good to eat. But then through selection, uh, cultivars of it that had a closed head um, were actually prized, and the seeds that had those uh, genes were actually selected for, and so you end up getting the cob structure, which cannot reproduce without human intervention. We normally say a cup can fall and a few things can raise, but it can't dis disperse its seeds. It back crosses up with Teosinte, so in the area where Teosinte, the wild ancestor, is found, which is all of Mexico and all the way to Honduras, if you have a corn field, you're going to have Teosinte as a hedge weed, and the Teosinte genes are going to keep coming into your corn. So my long ago professor at Illinois, um, Donald Laker, always beat into our heads that corn really couldn't be developed until you got it outside of Teosinte's range. And he was a South Americanist, so he had a particular dog in the, the fight, as they say. But his argument was that it wasn't until it was South Americanized that you could really do these kinds of things. And then, it would, then these hybrids came in. I don't know if that's enough information. <laughs> yeah, it's a fascinating thing. And again, I would look up Christine Hastorf's name for um, information. And you're also going to find lots of, that, lots of stuff recently about names. Yeah. Oh, you're the last question. You're a lucky person. But I think Lakeford was also indicating that maybe poverty came along. Uh, yes, yes. Um, still kind of the, uh, the current thinking, as a poverty specialist, is that poverty is earliest in South America, absolutely, very early in the Amazon, early in um, northern Amazonia, and early in Ecuador. But that the poverty that we have in Central America is independently invented by people who knew about poverty because of their contact in South America. So we have pottery in Central America by 2000 BC at the latest. Um, where I work in Honduras, the pottery I've excavated is the earliest pottery in Northern Central America, around uh, 1600 to 1800 BC. And that's sort of the time frame that's about 2000 years later than it appears in the Northern South America area. But it's not named the same way. It isn't the same forms. It's not the same. So it's the idea of pottery that was moving around, and it's not, and the idea of pottery was moving around because these people had very long distance contacts with each other. Fiber temper? Um, fiber temper is not universal in early pottery, no. It's not even very common in early pottery in Central America. So, thank you very much, and I wish you a good nod of the world, and thank you for